name's Lizzie Davis. I'm the Head of Leicester Radiation Safety Service at University Hospitals of Leicester. And I'm going to talk to you today about something that's really core to what I do in the hospital, um, but also will be a core part of the work that you do when you're referring for x-rays, and that is the legislation around the medical use of ionising radiation. I'm going to go through why there is late legislation covering this and why we I think it's so important. And then I'm going to go through the basics of the ionising radiation regulations, which um, tell us how to work safely around radiation as workers, but also covers how we protect members of the public from the radiation that we are using. And then finally, I'll go through the Ionising Radiation Medical Exposures Regulations 2017. And that's how we apply principles to the work that we do around exposing patients to radiation to ensure that their safety is protected. So why is this legislation important? Well, radiation can be dangerous if it's not used safely. We have a duty of care to our patients and also to ourselves and others. And that is why um, all of this legislation actually comes under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Health and safety is also a basic part of any contract of work. So it's part of your contract um, when you become qualified doctors. Um, the trust that you work at can be prosecuted if you do not follow either of these um pieces of legislation and the regulators have been known to walk around the hospital and ask random staff, staff members what the difference is between the two types of um, the legislation. So it is expected that it is a core part of everyone's knowledge. Also as individual employees you can be prosecuted um, now, this is very rare and most of the time the trust has um, policies and procedures in place that are actually there to protect you because if you follow those procedures then you yourself cannot be held personally responsible. So there are some core radiation safety principles. These are um, recommendations of the International Commission of Radiation Protection and they form the basis of all our legislation. So the first one is justification. So any time that we use radiation, we have to be sure that the risk is outweighed by the benefits to the individual who's exposed. Now, that could be um, a patient. So say if you're referring for a chest X-ray, you have to be sure that the risk that they're going to be exposed to is less than the benefit that they'll get from the di diagnosis that you get from the image. The next thing is optimization. So we have a responsibility to keep all doses as low as reasonably practicable. Um, so that could be at a patient level. So if we are doing an x-ray, we should do it with the least possible dose to get an image that is useful for the diagnosis that we need. Um, it could be at the level of a worker. So um, if you don't have to be in a room using radiation, you should leave it. The last principle is limitation. So this applies to staff and the public because of the fact that you do not directly benefit from any exposure to radiation. So there's no limitation on the amount of radiation a patient can be exposed to as long as the benefit outweighs the risk. However, by coming to work, you're not directly benefiting from that radiation. And so um, limits are actually put in place um, as to the amount of radiation that you can be exposed to. And I'll talk about So to start off with, we'll talk about ionising radiation regulations 2017. Um, and as I said earlier, this is about the safety of staff and the public. When you are working in an area that uses radiation, there are duties that are placed on you as an employee, and these are legally legal duties, and so you have to abide by them. So one of them is to not knowingly 
overexpose yourself or others. It's similar to other areas of um, health and safety where you're not meant to put yourself or others at unreasonable risk. There is also a legal duty on you to wear personal protective equipment where it's provided and required. So that could be lead aprons, lead glasses, lead gloves in some cases. Um, It's using the over the ceiling mounted um, lead screen, uh, using lead drapes where in fluoroscopy. And you have to immediately report if you know that that PPE is damaged. Um, This is to prevent someone else using it after you without realising. You also have a legal duty of care for the personal protective equipment and you have to return it to the correct storage. So, for example, if you're wearing a lead apron when you enter a radiation area, um, you shouldn't really sit down in it because it creases the lead and can lead to break up of the lead. So it should be stored flat um, or hanging on um, the purpose-made hangers for it. You have a legal requirement to wear and return personal dosimeters. Dosimeters are not optional. Um, They are there for you. And there was a a consultant who failed to return their dosimeter, not at this trust, but another one. Um, But when he did finally return it, they found that he had exceeded the legal dose limit. Um, not only was the trust prosecuted, but he individually was prosecuted. The dosimeters are there to make sure that you're not exposed to unnecessary risk. You also have a requirement that you report all incidents within UHL. Um, we do this using day ticks. And if it's a radiation incident, if you tick that box, um, then it comes automatically to radiation safety and we help to ensure that everything has been Now, one of the core principles of IRR is um, risk assessment. So the first thing that should be done whenever a new source of radiation is used is a risk assessment. Um, And it should also be revisited if there is any significant change to the work that's done in that area. So, for example, um, if later in your career you, you discover you find a new protocol that's being used in literature, you should always make sure that the radiographers have checked the um, risk assessment to ensure that it's not um, changed based on what you're doing. So the first thing is to identify the hazard. Uh, the second thing is how, who might be harmed and how. And then finally, you evaluate the risk and decide on the precautions and record them and implement them. And then you review and update if necessary. Now, one example of where this has gone wrong is at another trust. A doctor decided that they wanted to do CT fluoroscopy. Now, while we do CT biopsies at um, UHL, we do not do CT fluoroscopy. That is when um, the CT scanner is left on while the individual is manipulating the needle. The reason we don't do it is because of the potential for extremely high doses to the hands of the um, individual using it. And at this other trust, um, they did not look at the risk assessment, did not reassess the risk based on this new practice and the individual broke the dose limit again. uh, And the trust was... ...safety, we use something called the hierarchy of control. It's mostly just common sense. Um, But the first stage is if you don't have to use radiation, then you shouldn't be using it. The next stage is if you can substitute it with a lower dose form of radiation, then you should be doing that. Next, we have engineering controls. Um, These are things like the lead casing around an x-ray tube to prevent x-rays going in all direction and to Um, collimate them towards the patient. Um, They are very useful in that they don't require someone to do something in order to mitigate the risk. If we still have outstanding risks, um, we have to put into place administrative controls. So all radiation areas where you have to do something in order to not become a classified worker 
have something called local rules in place and they describe how you can work safely with radiation in that area. And then finally, if we can't control all the risks um, to a sufficient level, using these methods, then we um, implement personal protective equipment. And that's things like lead aprons. And the reason that's our last line of defence is it requires individuals in the area to change the way they act in some way. Taking into account all of this, the best way that you can protect yourself when working with radiation is to keep in mind three key things, time, distance and shielding. So if you don't have to be in an area using radiation, leave that area, you're going to reduce your dose. Um, distance is um, radiation mostly follows the inverse square law. So if you double your distance, you quarter your dose. So taking a step back is one of the most effective me measures of protecting yourself. And then finally, shielding. So all X-ray rooms have about two millimetres of lead in the walls around them. And that's to protect people outside the room from the radiation. So if you can stand behind that shielding, you're going to reduce your dose. So um, when I was talking about the local rules, um, any area where you could exceed the level at which you should become classified is called a controlled area. So you may see signs like this one around the hospital. Now, the top part of the sign, so let's say in controlled area, x-rays, if that is on, it means that the x-ray is connected to the electricity and could expose at any moment. When it's exposing, the red light underneath saying do not enter flashes up. So controlled areas have to be physically demarcated. Usually that is um, by walls around the area. Um, one, area one place where we struggle to do this is the use of mobile x-rays. And I'll talk about mobile x-rays later, but they are an area where there is an increased risk um, due to the way that they use. Then we have to use signage and we have to control entry. So we have to have a way of saying that you shouldn't come in this area while we're using x-rays and then control uh, local rules, as I said. And each area with local rules will have someone called the radiation protection supervisor. Um, now, they are the people who are there to ensure that the local rules are followed and they're there for everyone's safety. Um, so if you're asked to wear PPE when you're not wearing it, um, it's for your safety, so please um, comply. Finally, they will have a radiation protection advisor at UH Health that is uh, more detailed advice, say, on the design of the room. So um, the local rules are based on the risk assessment. They must be written and adhered to, and they will include things like the dose investigation level for that area. So if you go above that, we would investigate why you have been. So you may get contacted at some point in your career from us, just saying um, you've received a higher dose than expected. Um, could you please explain why? Uh, it doesn't mean that you're at a potentially high risk. Our dose investigation levels are very low. Uh, around the trust, they're around about 0.2 millisieverts in any two-month period. Now, um, the member of the public dose limit is one millisievert, um, and the uh, classified dose limit for the whole body is um, six millisieverts with the overall dose limit at 20 millisieverts. They also have to have contingency arrangements. Now, in diagnostic radiology, they can be quite limited, um, maybe just stating that the, um, the X-ray should be um, isolated from the generator in the event of an emergency. In nuclear medicine, they're much more involved and would require um, additional training. They'll name the radiation protection supervisor and identify the area that they apply to, along with how you should control. So I've spoken a little bit about dose limits. Um, they apply to all employees. Um, there are two, there's two levels. Um, so any employee that's under 18, which we don't tend to have, um, has a whole body dose limit of six millisieverts. 
that's also the level at which you would become a classified worker. Now, there's hardly any classified workers in this trust. The main areas that you get classified workers are in nuclear medicine and in um, cardiology, basically because of um, the finger dose in nuclear medicine and the eye dose in cardiology. Um, other areas um, have no issues in sticking to um, the dose limit, the classified worker dose levels. Um, and most people within the trust record a annual dose limit below the public, uh, annual dose below the public dose. So to ensure dose limits aren't exceeded, we will issue people at risk with dosimetry. Um, this protects both the individual and the employer, and disciplinary action can be taken if you don't wear. Now, one thing that you do need to be aware of is uh, something called outside workers. So if you go to another trust when you're employed by our trust, and you um, go and work in their controlled area, you are an outside worker. They have to provide you with adequate um, training to ensure that you um, don't um, unnecessarily expose yourself. We also have to work with them to ensure that your dose is kept as low as possible. If um, later on in your career you work for two employers at the same time and you're working in radiation areas, you have to inform your employers that you work for the other employer so that dose information can be shared. Outside workers are not comforters and carers, which are a separate thing, which I'll talk about under IRMA. Um, so if a, for example, if a prison officer came in to look after a patient, we would class them as outside workers and we would have to provide them as I said, if you get above um, three-tenths of any dose limit, um, you would become a classified member of staff. There are very few of these around the trust, um, and you must be certified as fit to work before becoming a classified member of staff by an occupational health doctor, and you must um, visit them annually to get recertified. So if you are working in a radiation area and you become pregnant, you must inform your employer in writing. This is because the fetus is seen as a member of the public and so we apply a dose limit of one millisievert to the fetus. Now that is in the declared term of pregnancy and so the earlier you declare it, the better. Um, it may require, well it will require a local risk assessment um, once you have declared that you're pregnant. However, it very rarely means that you have to change your working practice because of the low doses that we have around. What does go on um, with radiation while you're working in a hospital? The processes will vary from hospital to hospital, but you will always use the incident reporting procedure within that hospital. Here it's Datix, and if you tick the box that it involves radiation, it will be sent to us and we'll look after um, compliance from there onwards. It may be that if there's a breach of IRR, we would have to report it to the health and safety executive, or if there's a breach under IRMA, it would have to be reported to the CQC, but support would be provided throughout the process. Now, one thing, if there is an incident involving a patient that you have referred for, you have to legally be informed. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you have made an error, but there is a requirement that the referrer is always. Um, so practically, how do we implement this? Well, the most one of the most difficult to control situations is the use of a mobile X-ray set on a ward. Um, that's why when you're referring, if you can minimise mobile x-rays as much as possible, the patient actually gets a higher dose than if they come, come to radiology. The staff get a higher dose and it's less well controlled and the image quality is probably not as good. So they're all reasons why you should refer for um, to radiology for a normal room x-ray if possible. However, if you can't... Um, and it's likely that you'll be working on wards um, when a mobile x-ray is being taken. 
the area that's controlled is defined to be two meter sphere around the x-ray tube here, may be different at other trusts. And anywhere within the primary beam, which is um, between the x-ray tube and the patient, or until the primary beam is attenuated. So when I say primary beam, if you imagine a projector, if I was to stand in between the projector and the wall and you saw a shadow, that would be the primary beam, so similar with x-rays. Um, you should never enter the primary beam, um, even wearing a lead. A lead will not protect you from the primary beam of an x-ray. Um, so in practice, um, the actual hazardous area is much smaller because the workload will be limited, but lead aprons should be worn by everyone within the controlled area. Um, the radiographer should provide a very clear indication that they are about to um, expose and um, should ensure that the area is so next, we're going to talk about Irma. So this is about the safety of your patient. And basically, it sets out a framework for the whole patient pathway um, by defining procedures that have to be in place to ensure that the patient is referred, x-rayed, and, um, and reported on safely. Um, so on this patient pathway, anything that's in red is something where there is a required IRMA procedure around it. So when you're referring for an x-ray, um, you should explain the risks to the patient. There is another talk on that following this. Um, so it'll talk about the detail of what you should be saying and why. Um, you should specify if it's non-medical imaging. So that means if it's something for insurance purposes, immigration, to um, check for non-accidental in injuries, drug smuggling, that sort of thing. And that's because later on, the justification process carried out by radiology will be different for these individuals than it is for a normal referral. You should also check whether the patient is pregnant and state that on the referral because it means that it can be justified properly before the patient comes on to um, site and um, the radiographers will be aware of, of the fact that they may need to do additional optimization in this situation. Once you've referred, it then goes for justification or authorization. Now, justification is the process by which a practitioner, who is someone with training in the benefits and risks of radiology, usually a, a radiologist, um, weighs up the benefits and the risks and decides whether it should go ahead. Now, it may be a radiologist doing it directly every time, but more often than not, um, radiographers authorise under protocol. So that's where a radiologist has set down a list of exams that are justified, and then the radiographer just checks that they can comply with the requirements for the, those um, exams. So it may be that a radiographer contacts you for clarification regarding a referral. They're not being awkward. They're not trying to stop you from having that x-ray um, carried out. What they are trying to do is perform their legally required responsibility to make sure that they are working within the authorization um, parameters that they have been given. OK, um, so the next thing that happens is that the patient comes into the department and the radiographer has a responsibility to make sure that the equipment is safe um, and that they're trained to do what they do. And this is all covered under um, uh, next. If the patient requires a care or comfort, so carers and comforters are different to the outside workers we spoke about earlier in that they're not being exposed as part of their job. It's, say, a member of the family, a parent coming with their child, um, and it's anyone that has to go into the controlled area during the exposure to support someone. Now, they have to have their exposure justified in the same way as a medical exposure. 
So if you know that someone's going to require a care or comfort uh, when they come onto site, it's, it's good practice to put it in the referral because it means that it won't hold up the exam in any way later on. Um, they, the operator also has to identify the patient using three unique identifiers, um, date of birth, name and address. Um, and then they need to check whether it's a research exposure. So when you're referring, make sure it's clear if it's a research exposure. Once they're happy with all of those things, um, then they go ahead and expose using exposure protocols, um, which are associated with certain levels of dose, which are um, specified in our diagnostic reference levels, which are required by IRMA. Now, one of the things that's most important for you to realise as a referrer is that if you accidentally refer under the incorrect name, so you have taken patient A and they need a chest x-ray and accidentally put it on the system under patient B, it may be picked up if their clinical indications are not the same. So if the radiographer sees something that doesn't tally with the um, request, However, it, those are one of the most difficult incidents to pick up. Our radiographers do pick up a lot of them before they go ahead, but some of them do get through all the time. And those incidents, um, if they're a high dose exam, will have to be reported to the CQC and there will be an investigation. The CQC can come on site to investigate those types of incidents. So, it is really important when you're requesting that you get the right person, select the right person from on the electronic um, request form. Now, um, the final stage is that we have to ensure that all patients have a report associated with their image and that it impacts on the patient care. So when you're referring for an x-ray, you need to ask yourself, how will this influence the patient's care? Because if it Okay, so um, as I said, all of you will probably be acting as referrers at some point in your careers. Um, so let's just go through some of the responsibilities placed on referrers under IRMA. So you have to make sure that you're aware of the referral criteria and employees' response um, procedures. So the main thing that you need to know about is um, how to access iRefer. Um, so within the trust, if you're trying to um, access iRefer, you can just go to the iRefer website. It'll tell you what ind clinical indications you can refer x-rays for. Um, if you're outside of the trust, um, you do have to pay to have access. So um, you need to talk to your employer at that site to ensure that you have access to it. Um, you need to supply unique patient identification, sufficient details of the clinical problem to allow justification. So you can't just state that you want a chest x-ray. You have to say why you want it. And you have to provide any information on pregnancy status. You have to provide a signature that uniquely identifies the referrer. That means no pre-signed request forms given to nurses. If nurses need to refer, then they need to go on the non-medical referral training course and they need to um, refer under their own name. The other thing that you must not do is share logons. Okay, If you share logons and it's discovered, that is a disciplinary offence. It's like a prescription when you refer for an x-ray. You cannot do it under someone else's name. You need to make it really clear if the request is for a time delayed exam. So say if you need a head CT in six months time, it needs to be really clear because if it's not put, put on the system correctly, that patient will have it as soon as possible. Um, so just make it very clear if it's time to like delayed. And if it's research, you cannot do research um, using radiation unless it's approved under IRAS and has been locally approved by an MPE. Uh, you need to check the report um, and you need to implement. Okay, so um, the fetus is 
we believe more radiosensitive than, say, an adult. And that irradiation of the fetus must be avoided where possible. We believe that the maximum sensitivity is around the three to seven weeks. Um, so they may not know that they are pregnant. Uh, we follow something called the 28-day and 10-day rule. So if it's between the diaphragm and the knees, the radiographers will make sure it's done within the, the first 28 days of the menstrual cycle. Um, and if it's a high dose exam, so say a CT abdomen, they will try and do it within the first 10 days of the cycle. Now, that is only if the patient does not know whether they're pregnant or not. If they know that they're pregnant, it will be justified by a radiologist. Um, and if they know that they're not pregnant, it can go ahead. If someone um, notifies that you that they're pregnant after exposure, um, please day tix it. Uh, and we can help you dealing with it from that point onwards. Um, I'm going to say this again in a later lecture, but there's a great document um, on risks in pregnancy. If you just Google pregnant patient x-ray. OK, so if something goes wrong, say you have requested an x-ray exam on the incorrect patient and you realise as soon as you've done it, you can cancel it within the electronic system, but the, that doesn't always get communicated to radiology. So you always need to ra ring radiology and make sure that they are aware that you have cancelled it. Do not just cancel it on the electronic system because, again, that could lead to an incident that has to be reported to the CQC and investigated. If something does go wrong, uh, report it through Datix, tick the radiation box. Um, you will be supported throughout the process and um, we aim to learn from every incident or near miss that goes in. It may be reportable um, to the CQC or HC, as I've said, but if you have followed trust procedures, the trust will be held responsible and not you. So the main things I want you to be aware of is that you should know the radiation risks in your area and how to protect yourself. Um, if you're entering a controlled area, read the local rules and make sure you understand them. If you're issued with a dosimeter, wear it and return it and only refer if you believe that it will benefit the patient. Make sure you know how to cancel incorrect results properly so that you avoid any um, reportable incidents. Thank you very much for listening.